This morning we continue in our series on gratitude. As I mentioned there in the announcements, we'll be wrapping up this uh, series, and, and from my perspective, at least this year. And uh, as I said, it's appropriate, I think, for us to end the year um, focused on God and, and giving thanks and gratitude to God for all that He's done for us. And so I'd like us to focus on a passage of Scripture this morning in 1 Thessalonians. And so if you have your Bibles, I certainly hope that you do. Let's turn there together and look at a couple of passages where we're going to focus on a message entitled Being Grateful for the Church. Being Grateful for the Church. When we think about all the things that we can be grateful for, uh, certainly I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, what it means to be grateful for the church. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about the building or this facility located at this particular address, although I do think it's cool that it's on Cherry Street. Uh, <laughs> but what we're really, really focusing on is when we talk about the church are the people, and the people that make up the church, and uh, we're mindful that we're just uh, one part of the body of Christ, one gathering body of believers. They're uh, the church of Tulare, for example, would be much larger than just this church, and we are mindful of brothers and sisters throughout our community and the larger church that we're a part of. And, and so when we think about being grateful to God, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul and how he so often began his letters to the church uh, talking about how thankful he was for them. It's pretty much in all of his letters, but I'd like for us to look at 1 Thessalonians because uh, most theologians would agree that this is the first uh, letter that Paul wrote as he began his missionary journeys. He began to plant churches and places, and then he would write, he would get reports of how they were doing, and then he would write letters to them. And we certainly find that as they were inspired of God, they still speak to us even to this day in the church. Um, and as Paul wrote this uh, first letter, I can just imagine uh, this is kind of a new thing for him. He has now become this gospel globetrotter who's planting churches, and, and now he's writing to them to encourage them. And so he begins, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. And, and, and we always might just might want to circle that because Paul had something he clearly understood. When he talks about grace and peace, this is another thing he mentions in a lot of his letters. Paul understood they, they go in that order. In other words, grace always precedes peace. When you experience the grace of God, then you are positioned to come to know the peace of God. And uh, as Paul reminds uh, his, his, uh, uh, the churches every time he writes to them, he says, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Now, as we took some time with my family, had a wonderful Thanksgiving celebrating with my family. In fact, we're going to continue that today because we still have more turkey and we figure, why stop now? So uh, we're just going to continue the celebration. But one of the things that, as we had a couple days to pull away, uh, we were up in Twain Hart. Uh, some friends of ours have a cabin up there that they've allowed us to use for many years around Thanksgiving. And so we found ourselves up there again and, and just thankful for so many things. Thankful for the blessing of God, a storm coming through and all the rain and uh, just a little higher above us, some snow, and, and certainly thankful for the church. And as I read this, I was mindful just as Paul <clears throat> is saying, I, I, I thank God every time I, I mention you in my prayers, every time I remember you. And I can echo that. I think probably most pastors uh, have that sense, that feeling, that connection. And I just want you to know as we uh, wrap up another year, what a blessing it is to me to serve uh, with you as your pastor and to be mindful of the good things that God is doing as we continue to uh, give thanks for the church, the presence of the church, the mission of the church, and what God's called us to do. As Paul continues here, he says, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that God has chosen you. So a couple things jump out in this first passage, and, and that is Paul is, is kind of giving us a, an outline of at least his understanding of what the church is to be about, what the church is to be focused on. In fact, it's interesting, I think Paul is one who could clearly speak to this. Not only is he inspired of God, but he is like this, this primary uh, church planner. <laughs> He's been chosen by God uh, called by God for this particular task. And so if anybody has kind of a sense of what the church is to be about, uh, we would certainly think it is Paul. And, and so I want to come back in, in just a few moments and look at those things that Paul is saying, this is what the church 
is to be about, and this is why we're to be so grateful for the church. Now, if we jump to uh, chapter 5, uh, later in that same passage, I just want to kind of get some bookends. That's the beginning of his letter. Now let's jump toward the end of his letter, and Paul writes these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, what's interesting here is in this very first letter that Paul's writing to, to one of the churches is this question's coming up of when is Jesus going to return? And I thought it would be an appropriate time for us to, to look at this passage and, and think about it as we get ready to head into the Christmas season and uh, the reality that when Christ came the first time, uh, it seemed like no one was ready. I mean, no one, even though the prophets had foretold and even though uh, there were certain things that we can look back and say, how did they miss that? I mean, it looked pretty clear. And yet we know as we turn and look the other way that God's word promises that Jesus is going to return again. And that truth, that reality, that oftentimes the things of this world can so consume us that we can lose sight of this important truth. Now for the church here at Thessalonica, the reason that it's also very important is we must be reminded they're facing persecution. And uh, uh, the Roman Empire is persecuting the church, the Jews are upset. We even find in this particular passage because of the Christians in this new church, Paul had gone into the synagogue. In fact, if you want to read some of the the background to 1 Thessalonians, Acts chapter 17, is, uh, is a place you can go. It kind of gives you the, the idea of what Paul's doing. And, and so we learn there that Paul had gone into the synagogue. He was preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, that Jesus was the Messiah. So he got some Jews upset. Uh, so the church there in Thessalonica is under persecution. And so we begin to recognize why this question becomes important. They want to know, well, Paul, you said he's coming again. When's he going to come, right? I mean, uh, we're facing these hard times, these struggles, these difficulties. Is, uh, is he coming anytime soon? And so Paul's saying, you know, it's not, no need for me to write to you about that. For you know that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And uh, I know Abby's here somewhere. Those who know Abby Rogers just gave birth. This passage may have particular uh, importance to you as you think about how that, uh, how that reality can come about in childbirth. But, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing and now we ask you brothers and sisters to acknowledge those who work hard among you who care for you in the lord and admonish you hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work and live in peace with each other And we urge you brothers and sisters warn those who are idle and disruptive encourage the disheartened help the weak be patient with everyone make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else rejoice always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus may god add his blessing to the reading of his word in these two passages i think that paul gives a sense of what the church is to be about and what the church is to be doing and when we think about being grateful for the church i just want to highlight a couple of those things that we might celebrate and express our gratitude to God for what God is doing in and through His church. First of all, the church is chosen by God to focus on, Paul says three things here basically, and he praises them for their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope. Now notice, this is the same Paul, when you, when you look at these three things, he's saying there is, there is faith and there is hope and there is love. And these three things, faith, hope, and love, and remember if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said the greatest of these is love. But Paul clearly believed that faith, hope, and love were these three 
important aspects of what the church was to be about and how our faith, our love, and our hope began to shape us and move us. In other words, it's not just all of these things are like verbs. They're not nouns as though they're something we just possess and put on a shelf or put, it, uh, put away somewhere on the, on the table. But, but Paul's using them as verbs. In other words, because we have faith, because we have love, because we have hope, we do something. And that's what we're grateful for, the light that we can be for this community. When we think about work produced by faith, I think of uh, like our children's ministry. Right now, Kelly and a team of folks are working with our children, and we could characterize it as work produced by faith. They are focused on working with children and sharing and teaching them the Bible stories, sharing with them their faith, and it's this idea that the belief is that we're, we're not just doing this on our own, but work produced by faith means we believe God is meeting us there. God is partnering with us. We're working with God. That God wants to see a, a generation of children who, who grow up and know His Word, who know the stories of faith, who are encouraged by those stories. And therefore, when we think about work produced by faith, children's ministry would be an example in today's church of something that would fit that idea that there are people who commit time and energy and focus to a particular work, and what, what drives and motivates that work is our faith and the, and the idea, the belief that we're partnering with God, working with God, and in, in shaping and raising up the next generation. We might also think of Celebrate Recovery in this area. A work produced by faith Celebrate Recovery, a ministry that, that the church is focused on, and, and the faith is that nothing is impossible with God. Now, there are folks facing some tremendous obstacles and hurdles in uh, uh, Celebrate Recovery, addictions that have controlled them. Uh, well, just last week, we celebrated baptism with a vet, and, and her testimony from that baptistry about how uh, I've been living a certain way for 24 years. And I'm excited to chart a new course for my life to go in a different direction. And that is a work produced by faith. Again, the idea that, that we need God to join us in these areas or we're not going to be able to accomplish a whole lot. But, but God, through the power of His Spirit, is able to break these addictions, is able to, to break these chains that hold us back and move people forward. It is a work produced by faith. And then we think about labor prompted by love. Labor prompted by love. Again, we mentioned this, uh, uh, the uh, soup kitchen and the opportunities if you want to be a part of one of those teams. But I know when I uh, happen to drop by and come through on a Saturday morning, I see those teams at work, I can tell you one thing, what blesses my heart, it is a labor prompted by love. It, it becomes very apparent to me, not only that they love the people who are coming through those doors, who, many of whom are life are really in bad places, messed up. Many of them, in fact, this may surprise you, but many of them are, find themselves in places where they are just a tad bit difficult to love. And yet, because of the love of God, it is a labor prompted by love. It's the love of God that moves in our hearts and compels us to say, we need to do something. That's a human being created in the image of god and remember a couple weeks ago when i when i said to you uh we are the reason we're not to have any graven images is we are the images of god we are the images that god puts forth into the world just so that the world can get a sense of who god is and when we see people whom the enemy has gotten a hold of and and has brought wrecked havoc and destruction and chaos on their life because of our love for God and because of our love for humanity, and we recognize that is a person created in the image of God, we have labor that's prompted by love. There are things we do for one reason, because of our love for God. And I hope as a church that, as we think about being grateful for the church, that you can acknowledge and identify areas in your life 
where you would be able to point to and say, you know what? The reason I do that is because of my faith. That is a work produced by faith. That activity that I do, maybe it's in my giving, and my serving, but, but you could identify and say, the reason I do that, because so, other people in the world might look at you and say, why do you do that? Are you crazy or something? Why would anybody do that? And you say, that, no, no, that's a work that God's doing in me, and it's prompted by faith. Or you identify an area and say, you know, the reason I do that, that's a labor that I involved myself in, and it's prompted by love. It's, it's because of the love of God and how much God has loved me. God's love has changed me, and God begins to love people through me. And then he talks about the endurance inspired by hope. Endurance. The idea being that the church and those of us who are followers of Christ are not going to find this walk to be easy. When you think of the word endurance, it conveys the idea that there's going to be, have to require some persistence. It's, it's not something you just say, oh, okay, I want to check that box off. But, but the reason I keep working in ways that are prompted by my faith and the reason I keep laboring in ways that are prompted by my love is because I have a hope. I have a hope, and because of that hope, I can endure. I can continue to move forward. That's what the church has been chosen by God to focus on. And so if we're going to be able to do those things, if we're going to be able to find that indeed faith, hope, and love are not only transforming us as individuals in the church, but also moving us, prompting us, compelling us to do things that God has called us to do, to carry out the mission, it's going to involve a few things. I want to just highlight those quickly being the church, according to Paul in this passage, involves expecting God to do what God has said He would do. That's the faith component. We are a people of expectation. We have got to be expecting that God is going to do what He said He's going to do. Tyler, when he was leading this morning in worship, talked about God's faithfulness as we sang that song. And the reality that the church needs to continually be reminded that we are an expecting people always expecting that God's going to do what he said. So the first thing that Paul references in this passage is the idea that they're questioning in the midst of persecution, when's Jesus going to return? And he says to them, I can't tell you the exact time or date. All I can tell you is we need to live as people of the light. We need to live always expecting that any day Christ can return. And we're always expecting that God's going to be faithful to do what He said He will do. Now this reflects, uh, in, in a lot of ways actually, as we think about uh, Paul mentioning here, as we move forward in the midst of persecution, he reminds the church in, in Thessalonica that, that we need to expect to receive salvation and not to suffer wrath. In other words, he's saying, I know in the midst of the persecution you might think, well, what, what, what's our purpose? What are we doing and Paul's identifying there's a difference between light and darkness. You're to live as people of the light. These are ways in which you are different. You're to be awake. You're to be alert. You're to be constantly expecting. You know, as we think about moving into this Christmas season, the season of Advent, and the idea that Christmas is going to be on us, like, really quick, I pray that we will be keenly tuned in. In fact, I prayed it today you can tune yourself in to God so well that you go into this Christmas season expecting God to show up. Not just celebrating that God showed up in Jesus many years ago as a baby in Bethlehem. Yes, that's true, and we celebrate that. But may we as a church, as a people of expectation, totally take hold of the Word of God and His promise and His faithfulness and expect that God's going to do great things. You know, yesterday, uh, as we were returning from, from Twain Hart, uh, we, we were coming down, heading south, and I was keenly aware that uh, uh, as I listened to the radio, I was tuned into a radio station in the Modesto area that I was familiar with, and as I got further, uh, got down beyond Merced and closer to Madera, and now between Madera and Fresno, uh, that station started leaving me. And so I thought, well... Uh, I've lived in Tulare long enough now. I know some stations south, so I just 
cued in another station. Now, some of you are saying, who listens to the radio? I know I'm dating myself, right? Some of you are like, they still have radio? I thought they did away with that. And here's what I found. When I tuned in the station that I listened to in Tulare, it wasn't clear. It would come and go. I mean, it, I'd drive it down 99, you'd, you'd hear it a little bit, and then, in fact, what really got me, one of my favorite songs came on, and it just kept coming and going. And if you've ever been in that situation, I started just to change the channel. And it was like God spoke to me. He said, man, he is really weird, that pastor of ours. And I realized, as I was thinking about the message just today, that that kind of is an illustration of the way we live. We're, we're kind of in between. We need to constantly be struggling to hear what God's saying about where we're headed. That this is not our home. But as we, as we go there, the truth of the matter is sometimes it's staticky. Sometimes it seems like it comes and goes. It's not always as clear as we'd like for it to be. But as I drove along, here's what I knew. With every mile I pass, that station is going to get clearer and clearer and clearer. Because I knew I was expecting that to happen. Because I knew I'm headed in the right direction. And, and as I get closer, it's going to get clearer. And I just want to encourage you, church, that there might be situations right now you're going through where you feel like you're caught in between. And maybe, maybe it seems like you're getting a lot of static. That God and what God's wanting to speak to you about where you are and your particular journey is not as clear as you'd like for it to be. And I, I just want to encourage you that as a people who expect, as we continue to move in the direction that God has called us, May we have that expectation that God's word is going to get clearer and clearer to us. Just keep moving in the right direction. We are a people who live in a world where we expect God to show up, where we expect God to speak. I pray that's the place where you find yourself today, even as you come to church, that you come with an expectant heart, that God's going to show up, that God's going to speak to you, that God has a word for you. The second thing Paul mentions in this passage is not only the church involved in expecting, but also encouraging one another. He's just very clear when he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. In other words, he's saying a key part of the church is to encourage one another. How I many of you know that in this world, it's easy to get discouraged? There's so many things that can discourage us and, and begin to get us down. And so Paul's saying that the church is about a place where you come to find encouragement. Encourage one another, he said. Build each other up. He even gets specific here. <laughs> he talks about how you need to live in peace with each other. And then he says, warn those who are idle. <laughs> Might want to circle that word idle. What's it mean to be idle? I mean, we know what it means to have your car like an idol. What's it mean for a person's life? To just be idling. Going nowhere. Just the engine's running. The power's there. Things certainly could happen. I mean, that's kind of what idle conveys. It's not like, not like your car's dead on the side of the road and won't start, won't move. No, idle means it's running. It's just not doing anything. Why would anybody in the church in Thessalonica want to put their life in idle? Maybe, maybe it had something to do with the persecution. Maybe the idea, the thinking of the person who goes into idol is, you know, that if I'm actually doing something, if I'm doing work prompted by my faith, if I'm doing labors prompted by the love of God, then I'm going to open myself up to more persecution. How many of you know in spiritual warfare, the more you try to do for God, the more you can face an enemy coming against you? You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes it can cause you just to want to put your life in idol. Like, you know, can I just coast? Can I just idle? 
And Paul's saying here, encourage one another. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Strive to do what is good. We need to encourage one another. And I got to tell you, I've been, I'm so grateful to God and so thankful for the many people within this church, different ones who have been there to encourage me at some significant key times in my life. Encouragement. You know, sometimes it helps when we think about the role of the church is because we understand, maybe based on some of our own life experience, and we can encourage someone who's going through a similar situation. Many of you may have noticed uh, my little finger's bent. It won't straighten. And it came from a, from a, uh, a war injury. <laughs> it was a church picnic in Waterford, and uh, we were playing flag football. And I was on the old team, and there was a lot of young guys that we should not have been on the field with. <laughs> And they were beating us really, really bad. And at this point, we just wanted to score. You know, it's just, we wanted some respect. Like, we just, we just need to score. And so in the midst of trying to do far more than I should have been doing, I end up tearing the tendon off my finger as my finger got caught in uh, the belt loop of an uh, opposing player. And... Uh, I didn't even know what happened for a while. I was also, that's a whole other story, a little slow in responding, getting medical care because I grew up on a farm. It's just your little finger. What are they going to do, right? Well, I found out there's a lot they could have done had I gone and got the help I needed. <laughs> I live with that reminder of my stupidity. But here's, uh, here's one of the things that happened on that way. As I started having surgeries, I had to have multiple surgeries to try to, harvest tendon and reattach tendon. Good friend of mine said to me something that was so important at that time. I was a little like, man, I don't know, I have no idea. I'd always been relatively healthy, didn't have any idea what this all meant, and they're telling me you're going to have multiple surgeries on this little finger. And So he says to me, he said, Pastor, don't worry about it. You know what? I was a goalie, a soccer goalie in college, and I remember my finger got caught with a soccer ball and same thing he's showing me his finger look man mine healed up fine it's it's good you'll be fine you know just no problem it's no big deal and I remember hearing him say that and being encouraged by it like okay all right somebody who's been down a similar road can speak back and encourage me and tell me you know what I know right now it seems scary it seems uncertain but you're going to be okay now, i got to tell you the rest of the story. When I finished one of those second surgeries, he wanted to see it, you know, and so he's unwrapping it, or we're unwrapping it together so he can see it. And that's when they had attached the tendon back, you know, so it was kind of the big surgery. And I said, I said, did yours look like that? And I'll never forget, he said, no, man, that's gnarly. I... <laughs> no, mine wasn't near that bad, he said. I said, oh, thanks a lot. But the point being, if you've gone through a situation, a struggle, a challenge, that the role of the church is to encourage one another, to build each other up, to help one another realize, you know what, I know it may seem like the end of the world, what you're going through, but let me tell you, let me tell you the story of God. Let me give you a testimony about what God did in my life. And again, Celebrate Recovery is a great place where we see this happen. My prayers that happens throughout the life of the church May we know what it is to encourage one another. Don't be ashamed of your story. Give God the glory and tell what God has done in your life. And that leads us to the final point. It's about embracing God's will. The church is involved in expecting God to do what He said He would do, encouraging one another, and embracing God's will. And notice when we talk about embracing God's will, Paul's very clear here in this passage what God's will is. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstance, circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will clearly for the church is about rejoicing always, praying continually, and giving thanks in all circumstances. Now, how many of you know that those three phrases can kind of be uh, summed up pretty quickly 
You know, it's about rejoicing always, praying continually, and giving thanks in all circumstances. It's easy to say that. In fact, many of you are probably familiar with that particular verse. But the truth of the matter is, it's not always easy to do. Again, if we take the context of what that church is dealing with at the time, they're facing persecution. So much so that they're even questioning, when's Jesus coming back? <laughs> so much so that some of them are getting disheartened and discouraged. Some are even putting their lives into idol. And Paul's saying, rejoice always. For that's God's will for you. To have the joy of the Lord. Well, how, how can you do that? How can you have the joy of the Lord? How can you rejoice always? Not everything is good or worthy of rejoicing. And that's where Paul would send us back to point number one. We're a people always expecting that God's going to make a way where there's no way. God's going to come through. We're always expecting God to do what he said he would do. Praying continually, that's why we're always praying. We're always in communion with God, communicating with God, praying. And as I mentioned last week, as we grow in our faith, as we mature as a church, we learn that one of the signs of maturity is not praying God change the circumstances so that they're more enjoyable and comfortable for me. In other words, make it easier for me. It's not praying God change the circumstances. We begin to pray God change me in the circumstances so I can begin to, in your strength and in your power, navigate whatever challenges might come my way. And then finally, it's giving thanks in all circumstances. And I remind you here, it's not giving thanks for all circumstances. Many of you find yourself in places today, you say, I can't, there's no way I can thank God for this circumstance. But the reason we can be the church is because we are thankful in all circumstances, knowing and expecting God to do what he said he's going to do. And God said, I am a very present help in times of trouble. I will not leave you or forsake you. I am with you. And that alone gives reason for us to give thanks. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this church, this body of believers, and I thank you for all the ways in which your church is bringing light to this community. For we are mindful that there are those who walk in darkness. And God, we pray that in you, as we seek to represent you, to be your people and your presence in this community, may your light shine brightly. May we know what it is to continue to work in ways that are prompted by our faith. Be focused on labor that is prompted by our love for you because you have first loved us. And God, may we know what it is to endure, always being hopeful that you are working to accomplish good, that you are with us. And so God, I pray this day that for these who are gathered in this place that we will know what it is to embrace your will, to rejoice always, to pray continually, and to give thanks. For this we pray in Jesus' blessed and holy name. Amen.